It's Wednesday night, which means it's time for Quick Fix Golf at quickfixgolf.com, where we get together on Wednesday nights at 8 o'clock Eastern Standard Time to have some fun with our fellow members, golfers, and special guests. We have a very big special guest tonight we're going to introduce you to in a second. But meanwhile, we want to let you know that the show is brought to you by Quick Fix Golf, home of the free swing analysis. That's Tell them, Darren. That's right. Free swing analysis. And to take advantage, you got to get out your cell phone, take a picture of your golf swing, and then email it to us at quickservice at quickfixgolf.com. And we're going to do it for free. Like we said, not a penny out of your pocket. So why not take advantage? You owe it to yourself. We'll send you back an analysis with some drills to work on. You can't lose. And if you have legs like the girl in the picture, we'll give you lessons for life. Oh, <laughs> Here's our guest tonight, John Novosel Jr., who's worked and consulted with golfers of all kinds of abilities. Not like us, right? We only, we only deal with beginners. We can't talk to anybody else. I don't know what to tell them. And you're in for a real treat tonight, John, and, and so is our, our audience. You guys are going to be smiling so hard that you're going to need a plastic sur surgeon to remove it from your face. We're going to have so much fun tonight. So Awesome. Looking forward to it. Here's your book, Tour Tempo. How's the book doing? Well? Actually, it started off amazing. I went to number one on Apple Books right away and stayed there for about a week. And then uh, it's dropped down a little bit l lately, but maybe we'll get uh, pick up some sales tonight. But yeah, it's doing great. And we have your e URL there, tourtempo.com, in case folks want to see your site and see what you got. And you're yep. where, in Leewood, Kansas? Is that how you say it, Leewood? Yeah, my dad's in Leewood. I'm actually in Lawrence, Kansas, home of the Jayhawks. Aha. Uh -huh. Jayhawks. Go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, so we've got a bunch of things that we're going to throw at you tonight, uh, John. Yeah. And the first question we want to know is, what's the difference between tempo, right? That's that's the name of the book, tempo, tempo yeah. rhythm. Yeah. I think, you know, we use these terms interchangeably, but truly tempo is the pace of the swing, and you can measure tempo in the elapsed time. So you can kind of say it took, you know, half a second for this or a second for that. And so tempo is pace. Timing is the sequence. Timing is, is do these things unfold in the right order? And then rhythm in one word would be flow. Rhythm's the flow of the swing. Um, when you think of all three together, I think of Rory McIlroy. When you think of just rhythm, I think of somebody like Ernie Els. So that kind of just gives you an idea of the, of the differences. But I think Rory is sort of the ultimate for tempo, timing, and rhythm. Right. No, he definitely is. I mean, he's he's got it all. It's um, it's amazing to watch him swim a golf club, and um, you have differences between like a, a Ricky Fowler and a Roy McElroy and and an Ernie Els. Every every swing looks a little different, but when it comes to the tempo, there's some consistency in there, isn't there? Exactly, there sure is, and that was something my dad discovered in the first book, Tour Tempo, that. All these tour pros, although they look different in so many different ways, they have three commonalities when it comes to tempo. The first one is a three-to-one ratio of backswing to downswing. So they're going three parts back, one part down. The second one is that they're actually swinging way faster than you think they are. So, for example, like you mentioned Rory and Ricky, those guys from takeaway to impact, it's less than a second. Now, you compare that to your average golfer out there, and he's taking you know, two seconds or he's taking forever. He's usually got a lot of thoughts in his mind. He's got all these things he's doing. And it, you kind of need to do that thing. I see your little your little guy there saying, ah, shut up and swing. And that's what we <laughs> that's Bobby. Hey, that's me. That's, that's, what, what, I mean. <laughs> yeah, that's what people need to do because we get all this information, especially with the internet right now. Like you, there's enough information. There's plenty of information. We need to boil that down and get athletic and swing the club fast. And then the final piece of the tempo puzzle is consistency. We looked at Tiger Woods in one of his best performances in 2000 and 2001 at the U.S. Opens. He was, every full swing was 24-8. And I can explain what that means here in a second, but if you can have that same tempo on every full swing in the bag, you're gonna be a more consistent golfer. I don't know about you guys, but the, the, when people come to me, what they always want is distance and consistency. They must be able to chip and putt and hit it straight because that's all they typically want. But distance and consistency are two huge pillars to golf. Yeah, and yeah, I agree with you. It's every most people that come up to the lesson tee, they want one of three things: distance, they want consistency, and they slice the ball. There's no doubt. Yeah. 
it's it's uh, across the across the board there. That's what we hear every day, no doubt. Yeah, and I think what we make a mistake of as instructors and as golfers is we forget that tempo is a fundamental of the golf swing. So just as the grip is important in the stance and the backswing, tempo is also important. And tempo is something you can actually uh, take with you on the golf course. It's hard to take the five swing thoughts out on the golf course and use those and, and get better. Whereas if you can sort of bake in your swing thoughts and then you can rely on tempo and rhythm on the course so you can actually perform under pressure or just even out having fun. You know, I tried the rhythm method when I played on a European tour. It didn't work because I paid child support in five different currencies. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> what is sports? <laughs> oh, I love the Yoda thing. And I remember, you know, Yoda in the beginning of the book. For me, you know, force can mean so many things. And, and what, I, what I'm referencing in tour tempo force is what do you use to power the swing? Because whatever you use to power that swing, it's going to be needed, first of all, for the backswing. And then how do you power the downswing? And for example, in your short game, what we found is this two to one ratio of backswing to downswing for tempo. Mm -hmm. To create that two to one ratio, you use a pendulum like motion. Well, guess what? When you use a pendulum, the force there is the same both ways. So the mistake, cause it's, you know, a pendulum is driven by gravity and gravity doesn't change. So, what I'm seeing is when you're making your putting stroke, if you have this big long follow through or a real jerky follow through, you're adding force to that, to that through swing. And you don't need to, because if you use the proper amount of force, it should be about the same amount back and through. To me, one of the greatest putters ever is Tiger. He never had a follow through that was longer than his backswing. It was always a little bit shorter. And that makes so much sense. And I talked to Brad Faxon the other day on XM and it, he said the same thing. And he's one of the great putters. And so um, that's what it is for the short game. For the long game, you're learning to spring. So you only need to swing with twice the force on the downswing. So whatever it is that you load up with, you only need to unload with twice of that. I think most golfers think they just need to hit it as hard as they can, right? Or swing 10 times harder. And that's where everybody gets into trouble because it goes back to that word of timing. If you try to add too much force in the wrong time or wrong sequence, you lose speed. So force is what drives the swing. Right. And we're, we're going to get into that in a little bit here about the difference between long game and short game and, and okay. kind of the tempo in there. Uh, because I'm a, I'm a huge proponent of exactly what you just said there about, you know, the backswing and the forward swing and collision. But um that, that's a really good example of, of or a definition of what force is. Well, what about the yeah. three to one ratio? How does that stand with some of these Korean players that are taking the club to the top and just literally stopping? Yeah, I mean, Sung J M actually, he sort of fits the model once he's about halfway back or so. He gets to a normal tempo. Hideki Masayama wastes a lot of energy with that pause at the top. And for every phenomenon or every theory or whatever you might call it, there's always these outliers. And, and Hideki is definitely one of them. Um, the, the difference, the reason why he can get away with it and even Sungjae with his uh, interesting tempo, these guys have perfect mechanics and they hit the ball amazingly well. So they're playing good in spite of their tempo. Um, and uh, the average golfer, when they pause or have these slow backswings, they lose. Also, both those guys have plenty of power. So, you know, they, they don't, they're not needing for power. And so the average golfer needs more power. He needs more speed. He needs less thinking. So pausing and doing these types of things really is detrimental for the average golfer. Right. And I had, I can't even tell you, John, how many students after the master, masters came to me and he was like, well, what do you think about uh, this backswing? So you would completely say that no chance, no question, stay away from something like like that. What I would say is if you're on the PGA Tour and you're making millions of dollars and you're hitting it far enough, then you're fine. If you're not there, you probably need a faster fax. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> you know I mean? But I think what it comes down to is actually if you think pound for pound, Sung JM is a, not a long hitter. So – the average golfer, he needs to just get do everything he can to increase speed, less thinking, more at more athletic. So 
that that's what I would say there. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, what are some myths about tempo? Who, who's uh, this, this, hey, this, this is the Puente. 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 I don't know who that is, but <laughs> it might be my cousin. You never know. <laughs> what are some of the myths about tempo there, John? This is a great one. It all starts with, you know, Bobby Jones. He basically etched it in stone uh, 70 years ago or longer. That no one ever swung a golf club too slowly. And that's just flat out. I mean, the top players in the world, you know, Rory McIlroy, Dustin Johnson, you know, oh, Bryson DeChambeau, his swing is so How about that, right? So that's a big one. The other interesting, you know, it's another huge myth that I just, when I hear it, I cringe is, well, if you walk slow and talk slow, you should swing slow. And if you walk fast and talk fast, you should swing fast. And if you look at Bryson DeChambeau, is he the literally the slowest player out there? Oh, yeah. Well, guess what? He's got the fastest swing tempo-wise out there. Bernhard Longer, super slow as far as his personality. Guess what? He swings super fast, you know? So you, these, the, the, it's almost like saying, hey, if you walk fast and swing fast, you should be a one plane back swing. Really? You know, that doesn't make any sense. And it's the same with tempo as far as your personality. Um, I think obviously pausing at the top, you really can lose a lot of energy if you pause at the top. Um, that's another one that's I hate to see. Um, I think, I don't know if this is a myth, but we use words like slow and smooth. But let me ask you a question. What, what does slow mean? Slow would be a metric to me, at least, uh, you know, the well, time it takes to make a backswing. I know, but slow is a relative word. I mean, if, if you watch Rory McIlroy, everything seems slow. After, you know, it, it, it has no meaning in your own mind, right? You need, you need to figure out, you know, what are the, you know, what does that actually mean? So, so it doesn't really mean. Here's the way but, I look uh, at it, John, right? I, I worked in the Hamptons for 10 years. Yeah. All of my clientele were Wall Street younger clients yeah and they lived that uh, what i called the subway lifestyle where everything was going at that fast pace you know yes and when they came up to take a golf lesson it wasn't any different the the lifestyle they had in the city translated to that in the hamptons where everything was go 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 from what yeah. i called hurry up and wait you know they hit a few balls yeah. on the tee and they couldn't wait to get to the first tee and I saw that, and this just could be my, you know, one of the, the, the examples of how quickly they moved and swung the golf club based on what they did every day. And it sounds like you're, you're kind of uh, contradicting that a little bit, but I'm telling you for 10 years, I saw it. Well, no, I think, and in, in, I would love to, I agree with you. I will, what I'm saying is you should not try to rush your or you should match your personality to the way you get to you the way you approach the game but once you make an actual golf swing you have to conform to the laws of the golf swing right that that's that you don't get to you know have any special things there so yes get your approach to the game how you do your pre-shot routine you know breathing thinking all those things that's absolutely fine to kind of match your personality but once you get up to the ball, you need to conform to things that will make you a better golfer. And those don't, you know, those have no relevance to whether or not to what your personality is. Um, so that's just kind of what I, what I see there. Um, but the myth, the main number one myth about tempo, I think, is just, if, you know, if you have this long, slow backswing, that that's somehow going to be beneficial. And it's just, it's not been, it's not what the tour pros do, especially the greatest players that have ever lived. And it's uh, it's definitely you take the average golfer and you get them kind of moving athletically. You see good things happen. It used to be an old story. I used to say that the guy walks up to a bar to Arnold Palmer and he said, hey, Mr. Palmer, how do you do so well with that fast backswing? He said, I didn't know I had one. <laughs> exactly. See, that's my point about the word slow. No one, you know, it's all relative. So, yeah, that's very true. Um a lot of the tour pros talk about how they think they need to, you know, they, they play well and they're swinging slowly and then you watch it and it's super fast. So uh, feeling real, right? We're going to yep. bring your video up here. Yep, here we go. Now it's time to get serious. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> oh no. Look no, there's Frazier. Hey, oh no, 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 no. We do not want to see Larry Frazier. No, no, no. Oh gosh. Larry, give us a figure. <laughs> oh, we got these microphones off here. Hold on. I forgot to put it back to, I had it under me. <laughs> we 
We did Frazier's video just a few minutes ago. <laughs> There's Payne Stewart. There's Payne Stewart. Oh, I, 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 there yeah. we go. Oh, yeah. Man. Yeah. That's you, right? Yeah, that's me. I was down with uh, I was down with Flight Scope down in Orlando. Yeah. So take us through a little bit of the swing here. How long is it taking you to make that backswing? Uh, typically, I run at about twenty-one-seven, so it's taken about two thirds of a second. You can see I definitely get a little bit past parallel. Hands are high, hips a little bit. <laughs> yeah, and I love it. To... You know, I, I love that length of motion there, John. Because you know what? Next year it's going to get shorter, and the year after that's going to get shorter, and that's fantastic. I, I, that's exactly right. Yeah, got you're some right. Great motion. You know, I was. Where'd you I guys was... go? <laughs> <They're stuck. laughs> Uh, but, you know, I, I worked at the Bears Club for seven years, and and I spent a lot of time around Gary Player, and he had this yeah. really heavy golf club that he would swing all the time, and it helped him create length of motion, and it gave him momentum in the backswing. That's what he always talked about, momentum yeah. to get the club swinging farther back. And, um, you know, I think it's fantastic, and it's something most people need to work on. I think that's a great drill. I think heavy clubs get a bad name these days. Everybody thinks you have to swing something light, but heavy clubs are great to lengthen your backswing, just like you just said. I actually do that myself, and I think that's great. But, yeah, that's that's uh, that was just a year or so ago at, uh, I guess, a year and a half ago at Flight Scope. Yep. And, and speaking of weight of clubs, um, you know, I've never been a fan of the speed sticks, okay? When they first yep. came out, I was one of the first people that tried the clubs out, you know, the the, the speed sticks. And I didn't think they were that great. Everybody praises the speed sticks nowadays. I didn't think they were that great. What What do you think about them as far as training for speed? Uh, I, you know, I'm not a fan of that. I, I don't believe in air swings. Uh, I believe you have to hit something to get all the proper systems of the body working correctly. Um, so I, I'm not a big fan of that. I like to see uh, golfers, you know, hitting something. Uh, so that there's a braking mechanism to, to safely, it keeps the joint safe. Um, I do like swinging fast. I do like, you know, taking the governor off and things of that nature, but you got to find a way to do it that's safe. And you also need to sort of know where is the collision happening? Where is impact in this whole thing? And, and, and to relating again, going back to tempo, am I lining up this, my tempo at impact? So that that's another important thing of, uh, you know, when you're doing speed training, I think it's like a major league home run hitter. What's the worst right. swing, you know, feel in the world is it's a swing and a miss. Yes. They tear every joint in their body when they miss when they're swinging for a home run. So, so, so. tell us about, uh, you know, super stiffness. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. So super stiffness is this thing that Stuart McGill discovered when he was working with MMA fighters. And he found that as they right when you throw the punch or the kick, there's a pulse of electricity in the body. A lot of st muscles stiffen, creates the motion. And then as the, as the arm or leg is floating in the air, the, the, the body's very soft, so it's allowing speed to happen. And then right before, right upon impact, the, basically the whole body stiffens up to take that impact. And so instead of hitting you with just the wrist, they're going to hit you with that whole body. If you watch right at impact, you can see I've got a little thing called a cranny. Um, that's in the glute area. And that's my body, you know, stiffening up to handle that blow. Um, so that's kind of part of that. Also, I really actually in this particular swing, if you look at my lead leg, look how I've got that inner ankle bone really high. I'm jumping off the outside of that foot. It's something you'd see from a Justin Thomas uh, or those types of guys. Yep, there you go. That that uh, little bit. Yeah, little bit. yeah. There it is. There's that right leg. The left for me. That's my lead leg. Just really exploding off of that. So all those things I'm doing is to handle that collision through through all the training there. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of what super stiffness is. And, and the best way to train that is when you do hit things. That's why boxers hit into a punching bag right. and body you guys hit through the blocks and those things. I noticed the balls teed really high. Tell everybody why you do that. I mean, when you're doing a long drive and you're going for maximum distance, you've got to have a good, you know, a positive angle of attack to take the spin off the golf ball. And so you just see long drivers really do that. The other thing is when you get all the force out of your lead leg, it does raise that angle of attack. So, yeah, right. As I'm coming, watch me jump off of that right leg uh, right there. Yeah. And that 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 whole right side for me, that's my lead side really 
pulls up and that creates some parametric acceleration and that really shoots the club angle of attack very high, very positive. So that's why you just don't ever see a long driver with a uh, low T ball. Okay, let's get back to uh, the tempo again here with um, yeah. long game versus short game. Tell us your thoughts on that. G Let's give us back. a little, yep. Give us a little description on that. Sure. So for the long game, you're going to see that three to one ratio of backswing to downswing, and then for the for the short game, it's a two to one ratio. And what I talk about in the force is how much effort are you going to use between those. And, and so yeah, this is a great little picture here. When you're doing short game, you're not hitting to see how far you can hit it. You're trying to control that distance. So this is more of a pendulum-like motion that you've got these equal forces back and through, and that creates that two-to-one ratio. For the long game, you're trying to hit the ball much greater distances, you're using a double lever, you're loading the spring, so you've got a three-to-one ratio, then you, you know, think about the timing of that, the, the downswing's a lot faster, so that's gonna create more speed. So there's a big difference there, and it's, uh, it's something, I mean, that's why there's, that's why there's a long game and a short game, and they're two different uh, animals. So, you know, John, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a huge um, research guy. You know, Pels will tell you uh, a short backswing with a lot of acceleration. But, you know, I'm more of the opposite. I'm more of a bigger backswing, especially with the short game, putting, chipping, and a very short follow through. Yeah, but the Pels never played golf. <laughs> He's a, he's a rocket scientist. No, the guy no, he's, 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 he's an engineer, but oh, he's, he's never played golf. He's he's got a nice short game. He's got a nice house. Yeah, that, that, that backyard's pretty good. <laughs> but you know, help help us out here, John. Tell us tell us a little bit about, especially when it comes to putting. Yep. About I definitely in in the same camp with you. I'm in the camp of you need a longer backswing and a shorter follow through, and the, the reason for that is. If you take a pendulum and you swing it, it will go the same amount back and through. And then if it hits something at the bottom, it will have less follow through. And what the way it plays out is I believe the greatest putters like Tiger, Brad Faxon exhibited that. Um, I get worried on, and first of all, I have all the respect in the world for Dave Pels, but I get worried when you tell an average golfer to accelerate through a chip. I feel like you're, you're gonna see this huge burst of energy and no distance control. Yeah. So. I feel like you should take enough backswing that you, you don't have to add any energy at all, and that can be a way to become a great short game player. So true. So goes. I'm definitely with you on that. You can feel the rhythm of the, of the pendulum. That's the Correct. There's no resonance between – if you think of the word resonance, uh, you don't have that good resonance with a short backswing and a long follow-through. You're trying to add energy to a, a pendulum, and that doesn't make a whole ton of sense. All right, we got one more question, and then we're going to open it up to the uh, the peanut gallery here. Yeah, sounds good. So, uh, Robert Grover, uh, it's Grover. Grover, Grover with a B. Yeah, well, Grover with a B, uh, yeah, that's, that's yeah. I was um, I, I played golf most of my high school golf at Yale, and oh, wow. Peter, Peter Berlaski was my high school golf coach. So, uh, you know, uh, Grover was uh, he he, he had experimented quite a bit on myself and and peter pulaski up there what what can you tell us about grober and um and what you've learned from well him? let's let's get his picture up there yeah let, oh, there you go oh there it, not, i mean he needs a little work right That's <laughs> for <you>. yeah <laughs> he's my dentist <laughs> yeah yeah there's the real picture the way we first contacted and came in contact with Dr. Grober was right after the book came out toward tempo. He did a study on timing and tempo in the golf swing, and he sort of proved through the laws of physics the three to one ratio. And so, obviously, my dad wasn't a physicist, and I'm not either. And so, when that came out, that we, you know, there's an instant, you know, uh, bond there, or instant appreciation, and we started having conversations about all kinds of different stuff and. Why is this this way and this that way? And he did a bunch of other studies as well. But what what really intrigued me about that first study was the, when he started talking about forces, and that's what led me to that the next book, the Tour Triple Force. Um, and that's what I learned from him is this idea of the pendulum, the loading, the spring. Um, 
all those types of things and how they affect he is a brilliant mind out there and I believe he's doing he's doing some top secret stuff for the government right now. I don't know. He's he's an awesome guy. Right there. Awesome. Carson says the uh change that I think would be um so let me ask you a question, John. When it comes to Grober, did he ever did did he ever um or, or you guys work with he had this thing that he would put down the shaft and he yes. would create an audio on a golf and you put the headphones on, right? Did, did you do yeah. that? I did. I used yeah. that. I thought it was great. Um, yeah. it turned your, it turned your golf club into a lightsaber. Um, yes, yes. The, it was pretty cool. The only thing about that that was tough was you sort of had to swing and monitor your swing at the same time. And the, the, the time frames are so tight that it was really it, it wasn't super easy to use for uh, sort of the average golfer but i loved it i thought it was really cool um but uh yeah that was a neat thing and he also could measure the g-forces you could put into the shaft as well with that well since, since we're talking about audio what uh what can you tell us about tones in the short game long game uh i forgot to put this question in there but that that, that would be um yeah. No, sure thing. Definitely. I want to bring that up because that's what makes this whole thing tick. So what we did is when my dad figured out the tour tempo, we had to figure out a way to teach this. And so what we came up with was three audio tones to start one to start your swing, one for the top of the backswing and one for impact. So I'm going to play Rory McIlroy. Nice. Start, top, impact. Start, top, impact. So if you close your eyes and try to imagine to yourself, could you swing this fast? Because most people, when they try these tones for the right. first time, there's no way can I swing that fast. No chance. But uh, one, your, body's, your, your brain and your body are amazing. They can learn anything. And over time, you can learn to swing to these, to these rhythms. So that was the long game, that three to one ratio. We also have a short game ratio. Nice. Our top impact. And you can hear a way different rhythm there, right? It's a lot less a beat. It's more controlled, just like the short game should be. You're not trying to hit a chip shot, you know, 100 yards. You're hitting it 30 feet. So it's uh, there's a nice difference there. But what we found with using those tones is like you guys will like, it's this idea of off, shut up, and swing. <laughs> yep. You because, know, we're going to have uh, Brendan yeah. DeVore on tonight with us, but uh, we wanted to have some fun, so we didn't, <laughs> we didn't call him. <laughs> my buddy, Brendan. <laughs> but no, but I think, you know, by doing, by learning and, and starting to play this music in your head, music, they've done all this research on what music does for the brain. Plus, you're now, when you hear those tones, let me ask you a question. Do you think you could think any swing thoughts when you're trying to do the tones? No, heck no, no. You heck no, right? So that alone starts helping golfers. And then just sort of giving the brain this idea that, hey, in time and space, here's the three places you need to be at this time, which in normally in golf, you never give a golfer that. So by giving the golfer that, it's just a great way to just get, it's a different approach to the golf swing. And it's a, it's a really cool way to get at a golfer and not come at it through the left brain. So let's try a couple of questions from the peanut gallery or not. Yeah. yeah, yeah let's sure. do it. You ready? We didn't have any more slides, right? That was nope, it. That, that was, was it. it. Yep. I got one. So much like you, you do. And I can't <laughs> yeah, exactly. How do you figure if you're uh, like Tiger, uh, and what is it, 8, 16, 24, 8, 24, or a 7, 21? How do you kind of figure what's which works for you better that is a great question very good question the, what you need to do is you know get film your swing and if you if you if you have a way to time it you can you know there's 30 frames of video per second so you can either come at it you know 0 0.2 seconds or you can count the frames but try to look at your downswing and see what that number is if it's you know let's say you're 32 on the back and eight going down, then I would try to get you to 24 eight. That would be the goal. Um, now, then if you, if you, and I know you guys have an app, we have a free tour tempo frame counter app that you can get as well that'll help you count your frames. And then, then from there, you go try the tones, and that's the tour tempo total game app. And 
Try that 24 eight and see if you can get that to happen. Let's say you count your frames and you're 33 11. Well, we just, we got to get you somewhere in the universe. So you, you would probably start at 29. And then once you start to experiment with those different tones, find out which ones work best for you. Uh, Bryson DeChambeau went from 24 eight to 18 six. And he also put on that weight and the muscle and he got, you know, swinging a little better. So he's hit so much further, but part of that was tempo. And part of that was experimenting with swinging faster. So film your swing, see what the downswing is, try to match, you know, that. If it's just too slow in general, just start experimenting with 27.9 and then starting to move faster. What about one thing here, Johnny? What about people getting so quick they can't square the club face up at impact? That's what a, that's the rare person that needs to slow down. And so <laughs> the they, rare person. Yeah, they, so Ray, you that's going to help you a lot, Darren. <laughs> you see those. And you know what I see happening there is typically sometimes that guy has a slow backswing but a super fast transition. And then he's so fast in transition, he, he gets into a little bit of trouble there. Um, so I would just kind of look at that golfer's overall – uh, you know, swing and, and get him. If he was 21 seven, maybe he needs to go 24 eight and see if that helps him square that up, putting an emphasis on squaring the club. So John, is, is there a relationship between how the club face is orientated at the top and tempo? Wow. That is a great question. I've never been asked. Um, there, you, there you go. Um, you would assume that uh, the, a square like Dustin Johnson closed club face could get down faster, but he doesn't actually have a super fast downswing. He's got a long way to go. He's such a tall guy. But um, that is a good question. I've never looked at it. I, I don't know the answer, but it would be interesting to look at. I do know that when you look at combining mechanics and tempo, the average golfer that sort of has a Jim Furyk like backswing, that usually takes forever. And sometimes when you speed that guy, he speed that guy up. The loops and the the uh, you know the circus wheel thing, it all gets fixed on its own. So that's why tempo is a good place to start uh, panic sometimes for golfers. All right, can you uh, comment on uh, what is that, uh, Mark? Mark, go ahead, read that question for me. Could you comment on facial sling in the context facial of stretch sling? short sure. cycle? Yes, yes, yes. Um, Where I think particular well, tools, devices you would recommend for facial? Is it facial? What is it? Fas, fas facial, facial slings. Yeah, I think what you're looking at with stretch, shorten cycle, and facial slings are if you can create enough stretch on the spiral line or the front functional line or the back functional line. If you do it fast enough, you're going to take advantage of something called the stretch shorten cycle, and the stretch shorten cycle is completely things it's the amount of stretch it's the speed of what you stretch and it's the elapsed time between stretch and shorten and so this is why these quicker swings create more power i don't know if you guys have heard of a guy named kyle berkshire he's the reigning world long oh, drive yeah, of course he is. he's awesome he's incredible isn't he yeah well, guess what his backswing is super lightning fast and he's loading those fascial slings as he does it well, yeah, he's so got when, that rock going on, right? He goes back and forth, back and forth. He, yeah, he has, he's got the rock. He's got the long hair. But, <laughs> you know, but uh, when you do these, when you load these slings quickly, you're going to get an incredible amount of power. You know, you think that's a thing. I mean, you go out of your mind. Yeah, shut up and swing. Shut up and hit the freaking ball. You're driving me crazy. That's right. Get All it going. Right. And get One it. more question. One more question. Anybody else have a question? Yeah, I do, Darren. All right, go ahead. Let's see, Charlie. Hey, uh, John, you've been using uh, frames of a second. Yes. Can you do that in parts of a second? Is it, are we looking for one second total, 0. 0.7 and 0. 0.3, or does that vary a little too? Uh, you know, it's, it, it's, it's slightly easier to use the frames for a second, but yeah, you're looking for like 0. 0.75 to 0. 0.25. That would be a three to one ratio at one second. And then, like, Rory McIlroy would be, I believe it's 0.66 to 0.22 or whatever, um, something like that, um, somewhere in that range. Actually, that might be Bryson. I'd have to – I'd kind of have to look at my numbers again. But, yeah, it, you can do it either way. It doesn't matter. It's um, whatever makes sense to your own 
frame. It feels like the 30 frames per second, those ratios are easier to see and understand and think about. So that's why we like those. But yeah, you can definitely break it down into tenths or hundreds of a second. Yeah, Charlie's, okay, a, Charlie's a student of mine, and uh, we've talked a little bit about short game versus long game. And I'm a big proponent of blast golf. And I yeah, blast say, golf's great. Yep. I want to say that blast golf encourages more of a two to one full swing, which I don't believe in. But you know, Charlie well, and I have had conversations about it. And, and I've only used golf for the uh, blast golf for the short game, two to one. Is, yeah. Is, yeah. You know if that, so, Darren, I was just looking at my blast golf recordings here, and for the full swing, it it does a three to one. Yeah, yeah it's okay. three to one, Darren. I was looking at it also. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Yeah, I think that I, I I have personally tested blast golf on my putting stroke, and I put it up against my tour tempo frame counter, and it was spot on. I have not had a good chance to test it on the long game, so I, I'd have to rely on, on some guys that have t you know done it on that. But it's great to have that in feedback. I think that's a huge part of this whole conversation. Is you know, it's that classic uh, Peter Drucker saying, you know, what gets measured gets managed. If you don't remember when we opened this whole thing up, tempo is you know is time. And so if you don't measure your tempo, how are you ever going to work on it? And so using the blast, using the temp tempo frame counter, using the tones, those are all going to help you guys get some instant results. Yeah, you have to have something to measure it for sure. Yep, exactly. What effect is the uh, equipment on tempo? Come again? What's the effect of uh, your your shaft and, and club head, all the equipment you use? How much does that affect your tempo? That is a very uh, it, a deep question that, that is a, there is a lot of effective equipment on tempo. Um, the, the quickness of the way the shaft loads and all those different things and softer shafts and stiffer shafts. And uh, I'm not an equipment expert. I can tell you in general, the um, stiffer, you know, stiffer shaft is usually a quicker swinger. The, the, the softer shaft is usually a little bit more of a slower swinger just because of the way the shaft will load and that type of thing. But that's something where it would be interesting when you get fitted for a driver or, or whatnot to, you know, see how those shafts respond to different tempos of your own swing. Um, and it, that that's a whole nother study for the physicists as well is uh, how does the tempo, re, you know, affect the shafts and vice versa. Hey John, if they help pop out, do you have something there that will measure your swing speed with a calendar? <laughs> <laughs> uh, exactly. <laughs> Poor Bob good. Harris. Even for Bob, Myrtle. You get, it, you get it, Bob, if you, you ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> what about what about total weight and swing weight? Uh, what effect does that? Or how does that correlate with uh, with tempo? Yeah, that one there is a direct correlation. I mean, the heavier and the more swing weight, the slower the tempo, and and the lighter the the club, the faster the tempo you can create. Um, that being said, somebody like Bryson, I don't know what his clubs weigh or or or, or swing. He offsets it by being super strong and having a lot of fast twitch muscle and that kind of thing. So um, I think there's definitely a balance between equipment and, but in general, yeah, the, the, the heavier stuff's gonna be a little bit more on the 24, 8, 27, 9 side and the lighter stuff a little bit faster. All right, John, tell, uh, tell uh, our audience how we can uh, get in contact with you and what you're actually promoting right now. You got the new book, we got a do book, you have any yeah. swing aids that, um, that can yeah. help some people? T tell us how they can reach you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, I've got a couple other, you know, another site out there is I've created another site called tourtempospeed.com. So it's Tour Tempo, I mean, we put the word speed on, and that's got a lot of the speed tools. We've got something on there I think you would love. It's a, a resistance tool that gets you that speeded impact that everybody wants and gets you to start to do that Stuart McGill um, total stiffness concept. Um, that's, a, you know, a, a great product that we can sell on. Um, yeah, tourtempospeed.com, yep. And then the other big thing when you go there is you'll see I've created this, uh, there's three revolutionary books. Um, if you scroll down a little bit, yep, that's great. The recoding for power of series has been, I've got a huge response from this. And it's a way that you can use some simple equip, you know, fitness tools like a band or a medicine ball to start getting you to, to load better, to load properly, 
to feel these correct big movements and you can then use it with your own system because it's not really about, uh, I don't really get into specific mechanics other than we got to load this thing, how to get loaded. And uh, I'm pretty good at that. <laughs> another one, Bobby. Another one. You want to get loaded? Well, Come on over. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's about sort of re. You know, one of the principles I take uh, into consideration on this recode is something called reciprocal inhibition. A lot of times, people are tight because the let's say your triceps tight. Well, to loosen that up, you got to fire your bi your bicep. And so by putting a resistance band in a certain motion, that will loosen up the opposite muscles and get you turning better or loading better or whatever it might be. So there's a lot of great stuff in there. It's, there's about 12 to 15 videos. There's simple exercises you can do each day to really get you to feel how you can get loaded up. And like I said, some simple equipment that you might already have at, at your house. John, have you heard of the TheraBand? Yes. I told Darren he was having problems with his elbow. I said I used that thing and it took all the elbow pain away. It can depends on your issue and, and knowing how to use it. But yeah, Theraband. I use something very similar in here to, to the bands, um, but those things are very powerful for the body. And also, when the when you give the body resistance, the body figures out a way to overcome it. And that's what I'm trying to do in this Recode series as well. How can I give this muscle a little bit of resistance so we get this muscle to start firing? And when that muscle starts firing, good, better things start to happen. All right. Is there, well, is there anything right else there. you want to? Yeah, this is fantastic. Anything else you want to promote there, John? Um, no, this has been great. This is yeah. wonderful. I really appreciate your time. Great. This was yeah. great. You know, it was, um, you know, when I hooked you up and, and got you to come on, it was more of a selfish thing because I wanted <laughs> to ask you a bunch of questions. But um, we really appreciate it. Yeah, well, I appreciate being on and let me know what I can do moving forward for you guys. Maybe we could set up some sort of coupon code for your guys for this or something. Oh, for a day. Um, that sounds great. That sounds great. Yeah, let's, let's do that. Uh, let's. I'll get a. I'll get a code and I'll send it to you, and then you get it out to everybody that listen. And okay. So, great. Yeah. There you go. Yep. And how about the Tour Tempo book? How can they buy that? Can they buy that right on the site? The Tour Tempo book you can get right on the site. It's it's available for uh, iPad uh, right now on your. On your uh, Apple book, and then you can get it on Amazon as well. All right, awesome, awesome. I'll I'll I'll, I'll send you that email. I'll, my tech guy. Uh, I'll probably have that for you tomorrow morning. We'll get Great. you a code for some of this stuff, and uh, appreciate you guys having me on. Yeah, we got, uh, we'll send you the video. We'll send you the, the video. Of the this. link, yep. yeah, the link, so you can. We got a bunch of viewers tonight, and then we're going to launch it on YouTube uh, tomorrow. Which is gonna get a heck of a lot of views, but um, yeah, send us that link and we'll we'll send it to everybody that listens to you tonight. Awesome, I appreciate that. Thanks a lot, guys. Really appreciate your time. Thanks, John. John. You're thank awesome. Thank, thank you, John. Yeah, yeah. yeah thanks, John. Awesome. Thank you, thanks, thanks. Thank Darren. It was his yeah. idea. <laughs> really enjoyed it. Thanks, thanks Darren. Good yeah. night. Good. Good night, Chet. Good night, Chet. Good night, David. Well done. See you guys tomorrow. Good night. Good night. <laughs>